Jason is not able to come in today because of a family emergency, but I will step in in this place and, and guide us through today and introduce our speaker. Uh, my name is Adam Tukovic, I'm a postdoc with Jason. Um, so welcome to everybody who's, as Jason says, welcome to everybody who's been here before or not. Uh, and are there any uh, GPS related announcements? Right. So um, I have an announcement, and that is about Megan Sayre, oh. who is going to be defending her thesis yes. on Monday. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so actually, I'm a great contributor to the library. And it's at 1? 1 30. So, and in. Garner 2206. Okay, and there will be announcements coming yes, out, but exactly. get that on your on your calendar. So that's wonderful. And also, just to say, please, as students and faculty, reserve March twenty first through the twenty third. We'll be giving you more information about the students coming in for interviews. Uh, so keep that on your calendar. And on Friday, the entomology students are going to have their symposium, and I think some of our I think students may be presenting during that time, and we're also having students coming and visiting who may be part of the NRT programs. Yeah, I was just cleared to be on the Board of Science Counselors for the uh, National Toxicology Program at the National Institutes of Health. So I'll spend four years here doing toxicology. It's a hard time. <laughs> Other announcements? Yeah, I okay. Well, it's my pleasure then to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kara Greger. Uh, she started her university education at Michigan State University, where she received a BS in botany and plant pathology and an MS in plant biology. She then went to the Technologi Technical University of Denmark to receive an MS and PhD in environmental engineering. Since 2011, she has been a senior environmental research scientist at RTI International in Durham. And in 2017 and 18, she was a Duke University visiting scholar. Her key areas of research focus on strategies to understand and make decisions regarding the societal impacts of risks, technologies, and products of innovation. In the past decade, she has evaluated health, environmental, and social impacts of nanotechnology and nanomaterials, and recently has worked on the governance of geoengineering, which I hear some about today. Uh, and most recently, she has been working with colleagues at NCSU over the past two years on the responsible innovation of nanomaterials. And most significantly for us, she will be uh, joining us as a senior research scholar in GES starting in the middle of March. So, <laughs> it's a great opportunity to get to hear from her today. Thank you so much. So that was a great intro. I'm really happy to be here, and I really look forward to meeting all of you in the coming weeks and months. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll be over in the home library and um, planning on attending this seminar series or Tuesday. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting to know everybody today. And I realize what I'm going to talk about is very probably very different from maybe what you normally work on. Um, but the commonality will be within risk governance and decision support mechanisms with this emerging risk emerging technology. Um, so actually what I was going to do is just kind of give a brief intro. I'll probably make that extra brief because of the nice intro that Adam gave you um, about who I am, what I've been working on, so you can kind of get to know like maybe my, my core research uh, areas and where I'm going. Then I'm going to present on this a new topic for me on solar radiation management governance. Um, talk a little bit about my next steps here that I'll be doing, and then answer any questions that you have. And I think I've understood that the presentation should be about half an hour, right? So, okay, so that's what we'll, we'll aim for. Um, okay, so yeah, as Adam mentioned, I'm currently at RTI. And I was also at Duke University recently, and the work that I'll present today was with colleagues at, at Duke University. Um, I also taught a little bit at Meredith College for a year, and I taught uh, plant bio and environmental science in one of their um, courses there. And it was a fun fact, like I had to drive this little bus around. We had all these little stations that we had to go to uh, across the county. So in addition to teaching um, and doing the lab, I was also like their, their bus driver in one of the classes. So that was really fun. Um, 
Yeah, and it was at uh, the Technical University of Denmark or GTU for a while. I lived in Denmark for almost 10 years um, and have a lot of close collaborations and have colleagues still there. And then I was at FSU. So, okay. Yay, I'll be coming soon. <laughs> Here. So, my core research areas are, again, really within this messy intersection of risk analysis, risk assessment, um, risk governance of emerging technologies, focusing mainly on nano, um, but I've also dabbled in a little bit of other emerging uh, technology fields, and decision support methods, so for emerging risks, uh, also related to risk ranking and prioritization, and as well as uncertainty. So um, right now, I'm one of the co-PIs on this RTI-NC State collaboration called Water Sustainability Through Nanotechnology. Jacob Jones is the PI. So this is how um, I got to know even more folks here at NC State is through this collaborative program um, and project. And I'm also the lead, the RTI lead on this Calibrate project is funded by the European Commission and it is very broad um, and it focuses on risk governance strategies for nanomaterials. So I will still be involved even after I come to NC State, but as an advisory board member. Um, I also have additional expertise in food safety and policy since I've been working a lot with FDA over the years. I've worked um, doing expert elicitation and yeah, maybe we can, I can use some of this going forward as well. Um, I've also been working a little bit in sustainable swine biogas production here in North Carolina with folks at, um, at RTI. Dabbled a little bit in the ethics of artificial intelligence. There's a lot of interesting work going on right now in this. And then um, you'll hear about the risk governance of climate engineering in a second. But fun fact, we also, I also have one official publication on SynBio <laughs> with colleagues from the um, Army Corps of Engineers uh, as well. So I anyway, wanted to share that with you since we're here in the GS somewhere. Okay, so now I'm going to dive right into climate engineering governance um, discussions. And I always like pause when I think about this topic because I'm like, wow, like we're, you know, for me it is like very, um, it's a big topic, right? I mean, <laughs> I have children, I'm sure you do too, and so it really strikes home to think about like our world, our planet, our, you know, society. So I, I probably don't need to tell you that the impacts of global climate change have never been more, you know, in our face as a society, in the news. Um, probably maybe for the first time your friends and neighbors and families are maybe even talking about it, right? So it's really here, it's really present. We, we, we saw the devastating effects from Hurricane Florence um, and Michael last year. My father had a waterfront home in New Bern, historic, in the historic district of New Bern that was completely, you know, Ruin, first floor ruin, still working 12 hours a day trying to renovate it. Anyway, so it's really like, okay, hitting home. So it's happening. And we've had um, students going on strike recently because they're saying, hey, this is our future, guys. You know, we need um, the politicians or other decision makers to take this more seriously. We're going on strike. Um, lots of things being led by this amazing activist, Swedish activist who's 16. Anyway, so, you know, we see it. It's here, um, it's in our face, in the media. And it's pretty clear that, um, that you know, we need to act. In fact, the, the Paris Agreement, um, one of the outcomes is that we really need to try to hit the 1.5 to 2 degree warming threshold in order to avoid many of the most severe impacts from, from global climate change. Um, anything above that really can have uh, devastating effect, effects on our society and economic output. So we were trying to get, we're trying to stay within the 1.5 to 2 degree uh, warming range. And um, so this is, you know, just a very brief, uh, generic uh, figure here, but we know that over time that 
if we don't do anything, the impacts of climate change are going to be very severe. If we use only mitigation or cut our emissions aggressively, that these impacts are going to, you know, be, be less. But there is some discussion, well, do we need to do more than just emit less carbon and other greenhouse gases? Do we need to do more? And in this, we mean, like, do we need to do some engineering? Do we need to re either remove the carbon from the atmosphere or um, also use some solar geoengineering technology? So this is the start of another conversation. So, um, so CO carbon dioxide removal technologies include things like ocean iron fertilization. So you would sprinkle iron particles in the ocean um, to generate <coughs> phytoplankton growth. You also have carbon capture and storage. Also some discussions on deforestation. And I, I will note that genetically engineered trees can play a role here, at least has been discussed. Should we genetically modify trees so they could absorb more carbon or, um, I don't know, deal with some of the impacts uh, in a more resilient way. So this is, you know, being talked about. Another set of Geoengineering methods, sorry, relies on solar radiation management. These include things like um, putting reflective aerosols in the stratosphere, kind of to simulate a volcanic eruption, or cloud seeding that you could reflect sunlight from from clouds, or even using space mirrors. So these are the two set, sets of geoengineering technologies or climate. Um, engineering technologies, the carbon dioxide removal and the solar radiation management. And for this, we're going to focus on um, the latter, the solar radiation management technologies, and in particular, these reflective aerosols, or what's known as stratospheric aerosol injection. So this technology is the idea <coughs> that we would purposely you know, inject different aerosol particles into the stratosphere to um, reflect incoming solar radiation. And it does not attempt to return you know, the climate to previous states. So if we mitigated um, or cut our emissions or remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, this is trying to you know, just take the, the, the carbon out to try to go back to previous state. But this is not this. This solar radiation management you would still have your high levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You would still have ocean acidification. Um, you would just try to limit the incoming solar radiation. But one, you know, um, main reason why this is being considered more seriously is that it could probably be the cheapest and most, um, yeah, cost effective and technology and to provide a fast response. So you can do it now. Um, I mean, assume, assuming that the technology is working, we can do it now and it would work, you know, relatively soon. So that's one of the reasons why it's being, you know, thought about a little bit more. But of course, as you can imagine, there's a ton of different controversies, right? With it. And we'll talk about all the impacts and the issues in a few slides. but. You know, wow, talk about deep, extensive uncertainties here. Is it going to work? What are the impacts um, across the, the planet? Um, a lot of ethical, societal, legal issues that you can imagine. Should we do this? Do we have the right to do this? Who gets to decide? What's the global climate, um, like the ideal? What, like, what are we trying to set it at? Who gets to decide that? Who's the winners? Who are the losers? How do you even make decisions? Um, and a another main um, argument against even researching solar radiation management technologies, or SAI, is that it could be a slippery slope that would even researching this um, <coughs> making mitigation efforts. So would, for example, policymakers say, oh, we can just, you know, let's just continue business as usual because we can just do this technology. Um, so th that's why a lot of environmental groups have pushed back because they don't even want to open the, that Pandora's box, you know. So, okay. <clears throat> yeah. Would it uh, hurt solar power generation? That is another 
question <laughs> or impact. Right. Exactly. So we'll talk so about some of the impacts, but generation by coal. Right, but you there <laughs> certainly be like some regional differences. So um, yeah. Anyway, okay, so now yikes, right? Talk about tough decisions. Um, on one hand, you have the risks of climate change and the fact that we've had decades of international discussions and agreements and, I mean, it's great, but have we really decreased our global climate emissions? I mean, you know, so, so this is a situation, okay. Are we going to be able to do it? Certainly not. It doesn't look like it if we're trying to aim for a two degree warming limit. But on the other hand, we also have the whole risk of climate engineering. Well, you know, does even work as it's intended to work? We have a lot of different lessons from other technologies that haven't exactly worked how we initially thought that they would. So will it, will it work? Um, what are the potential impacts? Is, would it really be cost effective if you have a bunch of external externalities on it? Um, and then, of course, who decides on what's the desired temperature? Who manages this? I mean, yeah, lots of really tough decisions. So given this, it's very clear that we need governance. Or a lot of folks have um, proposed different governance uh, mechanisms, that we need governance to even talk about research and development of this technology, or even to try to develop robust decision support methodologies around this topic. So in general, the idea is that in order to really make good decisions, you really need to have as much information as you can, which means to do some research. This would not only, you know, help understand some of the potential environmental health, health, social, legal, and ethical implications, but to reduce uncertainties and to ultimately assess, assist decision makers. And I won't read the whole thing, but um, a recent report really kind of sums this up well that, you know, we need to do work on governance now. Whatever your belief is about the ultimate technology, maybe we need just more information right now. So in response, there's been a number of different governance initiatives that have been launched. Um, there's a big group, or there's a, a strong group, I guess, in Harvard, at Harvard. They have their solar geoengineering group with David Keith there. There's C2G2. There's another um, strong group there. Actually, at Duke, we have a new geoengineering collaboratory that I'm a part of. So we're trying to grow that, and um, so there's a number of different, you know, groups out there that are either trying to do more research or different governance recommendations. But of course, it's still very, very early. Um, okay, so this is the current situation with the need for governance right now. <clears throat> and when I started, when I um, became more involved at it with Duke University and their geoengineering collaboratory group. I brought with me my my familiarity and my um, knowledge of the IRGC. Does anyone here know the IRGC or have you worked? Yeah, with them. Okay, so a few of you. So <clears throat> for those of you who are less familiar with IRGC, it's the International Risk Governance Council, and they're a, independent nonprofit foundation um, located in Switzerland. They are tasked with, you know, uh, help understanding and managing complex systematic risks. And they've worked on a lot of different case studies before, like carbon capture, nano, um, synthetic biology, autonomous vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. And they're, um, they have a lot of different case studies on different uh, risk governance um, uh, case yeah uh, applications to these different um, case studies that involve a systemic very complex risk. So when I started learning more about <coughs> um, geoengineering and solar radiation management technologies, uh, this naturally came to my mind. And they have a risk governance framework, and I have a copy if anybody's interested in looking at it. But they have a the risk governance framework that was 
originally published, I think, in the early 2000s, and then it was revised recently. And the governance framework is really different uh, steps and approaches to governing um, risks that have, um, they separate really the technology assessment part. So over here you have like understanding, you know, the, the problem, problem solving, or sorry, problem framing, um, and then the risk assessment, concern assessment, and then also uh, coupled with the decision making component. <clears throat> So this is a normal risk governance framework. And a few years ago, they also published um, their uh, guidelines for emerging risk governance. So emerging risks are different than more familiar risks. I mean, they're emerging, so they have <laughs> less you know, knowledge, you have less knowledge about it or familiarity. So it's emerging risks with more uncertainties. And the guidelines are really set to um, guide Different risk managers and decision makers to deal with and um, deal with an emerging risk or different steps that you can you can take to deal with an emerging risk, <laughs> and it's linked to strategic decision making and, and foresight. <clears throat> and this can be applied to like any risk. And this is why I thought maybe it could be interesting for you if you're if you're working with the risk of genetic engineering um, person bio or whatever that you know you can think about these steps in your own mind um, case helpful and in fact if you, it just the steps are logical um, and we'll go through them but you know the first for the emerging risk guidelines is like to make present of the future sorry make um, sense of the present and explore the future so what are the risks and how could the risk either um, diminish or accelerate depending on different factors you can develop scenarios to think about how those risks would develop over time. You can then um, identify some risk management options. What are those steps that you can take to um, diminish the identified risks? You can implement the strategy and then you can review your development your decision and revise as needed. So, so this is the, the general um, framework for the emerging risk governance guidelines. And so back to so the radiation management or stratospheric aerosol injections. I thought, hmm, I wonder how the risk governance, um, the the guidelines for the emerging risk governance would, you know, would work in the case of stratospheric aerosol injections. Mm -hmm. It is an emerging risk, and IRGC seems to be pretty good at handling risk governance and emerging risk. So let's let's see how this framework, um, you know, um, is or how it performs for stratospheric aerosol injection. So I actually got this idea during the presentation at Society for Risk Analysis meeting. <laughs> um, I don't know if any of you go there, but I, um, David goes there. I think. Yeah. Anyway, so that was at this uh, pres at this presentation, those presentations at that time. Let's maybe check this out. So we, in this uh, perspective commentary article that's in environmental system and decisions, we walk through um, the different steps of the IRGC's emerging risk governance guidelines for mm -hmm. stratospheric aerosol injection, and the idea is really to look at um, best practices and, and to further the field of decision support for um, solar radiation management technology. So what I'm going to present here is just really a snapshot of it because I didn't think it was really worthwhile to get all into the weeds of the analysis so I'm just going to kind of show you the most important point and then um, maybe you can think about it in your own mind in terms of how you could apply such an approach to your own risk field. <laughs> okay so I'm going to show you, I take these five steps and then I put them into another figure like this um, so it's a little bit easier to see. So you'll see, you'll keep seeing this, this uh, figure every few slides with the take home messages for each of the steps. Okay, so the first step is make sense of the present and explore the future. And the whole point of this is to, to say, okay, what's the situation right now? What are the risks? What are the threats? Um, and what are different factors that could lead to the risks either accelerating or diminishing um, 
if it diminishes, like then it can turn into a, a regular risk or a more familiar risk, and you can deal with that with the known risk uh, management strategies. Okay, so step one, where are we? So it's really clear that we're in really early stages of research with stratospheric aerosol injection. We have a few different particles that could be used. Um, and coming from the field of nanomaterial risk, this actually is really helpful <laughs> for me because I can quickly get up to speed with this. But there's different sulfur particles. Um, sulfur dioxide is one of the main ones. We have titanium dioxide, um, aluminum oxide, silica dioxide, and, and others. So these are some different particles that could be used. Right now, there's only two solar radiation management um, outdoor studies that have been conducted that we know of to date. One of them is called um, EPs, and this is actually was conducted off the coast of California. And it's, it's not even related really to the um, stratospheric aerosol injections, more related to cloud brightening, green cloud brightening. Then we also had, we know about one Russian experiment where they injected some uh, salt particles, I believe, from a, from a car and another um, plane. This was in 2008. And um, so those are the two, only the two that we know of right now. Then the SPICE experiment was canceled. <clears throat> and then there's a SCOPEX that was also canceled, but it's rescheduled for some time this year. So, so we know that um, there haven't been very many outdoor studies conducted, that there's a long range of potential impacts just based on our current knowledge um, with different models, climate models, or different um, experiments. So on the technology side, and that we could spend the entire talk about all the different impacts. So I'm just giving you a very quick like glimpse. So with the technology, there are still questions on what are the best particles? What are the deployment quantities? Like how much do you use? Where should we actually deploy them? I mean, where's the best location? Do you want to do it over the um, equator or the you know higher? Um, or like in the Arctic region. I mean, we don't know where the best location is to, to do this, if we were to do it. What are the, what are the real costs when everything would be to be involved? And again, who manages this? So it's all lots of different um, questions to still sort out. On the environment, yeah. Do you know what wavelength range these particles are acting on? Is it ultraviolet or visible light? This is pertinent to the question about impact on solar power. Sure. I don't know. I could look into it for you. I don't think I even read um, anything with my with what I looked at. I don't mm -hmm. believe I, I read anything about that. But I'm sure somebody exists. I mean, I think um, those folks that are involved in developing those particles for this purpose, you know, then those are the papers that mm -hmm. I get pointed to. Okay. So for the environment, there's some questions on impacts to agriculture. Um, Would this change precipitation patterns? As I believe that there's some discussions on impacts on monsoon patterns, um, other ecosystem functioning. Would this increase your acid rain deposition? And another big question is what happens if you stop suddenly? So for example, let's say we rely on this program for our climate um, management and then we had there was a war, and then the it, you know the program had to be stopped suddenly. Then we we were pretty sure that the, the rate of warming would be very sudden, or there'd be a really high increase in warming in a short amount of time that would cause uh, very severe impacts. So and there's a whole there's a whole range of other impacts as well. But from the social, ethical, legal side, um, would this, you know, impact all of our international discussions on reducing emissions? <laughs> Could this be weaponized? Would there be regional disparities? You know, winners and losers. Um, that's probably going to lead to international tensions. Um, what happens if you have a rogue actor? So somebody with 
money could do this on their own. And then, you know, you impact the rest <clears throat> of the world. And so, I mean, you can only imagine all the different scenarios that could unfold. So these, all of these risks and threats could be um, accelerated or diminished based on a number of different factors. <clears throat> so you can imagine the technologies, these technologies, the SRM technologies or other geoengineering technologies or energy technologies their maturity, their costs, and um, efficacy. So, for instance, what if we can, like, um, what if um, renewable energy was all of a sudden a lot cheaper, and then then we could just use um, more renewable energy? Or what if the cost of SRM technologies was too great, then, then it was not cost-effective to use anymore? So you see all of these costs and technology maturities is going to play a role in how this all plays out. What if we reach a type of tipping point with the climate so that then the urgency to make a decision becomes even greater than it is right now? Then this is probably also going to change um, different scenarios that could lead to a different risk situation. What if you have the unilateral development or deployment by rogue actors? Um, <clears throat> and also the state of the global mitigation agreements certainly will play a role in how these risks could diminish or accelerate. Okay, we also know that there are no um, international laws that specifically cover SRM right now. But there are a number of different laws or treaties that could apply, but it's really unclear. And there's no governance initiatives or monitoring to date. There are a number of different governance recommendations that have been proposed, but they're just recommendations. They're, they don't have teeth at all. And there's been very little public engagement. So to wrap up step one, and really steps one and group to three are the, the main ones, and then um, four and five are uh, very significant. So anyway, so step one is that we're definitely in a very early stage of research. There's no international regulation um, or national regulation, and there's a whole list of different implications that we don't know about. So there could be different scenarios, and we, we talked about these already a little bit, like those factors that could emerge or that could lead to risk emergence or risk dissip uh, dissipation. So the whole step, uh, point of step two is to really identify some of these scenarios. And a couple of different authors, and I think I'm just going to present one to you, um, kind of walk through some of the different scenarios that could unfold. This is work done by the Woodrow Wilson Institute. So one, one scenario is like there's no geoengineering that we'd only rely on mitigation and adaptation. That could be a global, um, global relationships or global uh, discussions are uh, like going well and people all agree to cut emissions. Another um, scenario is that we, we could do carbon dioxide removal, but not the stratospheric aerosol injections um, if it was too, seen as too problematic. Or that we rely more and more on just an energy transformation policy and we don't need also the stratospheric aerosol injections. So this would really depend on different funding priorities. Another scenario is that what if you, could we you know, invest in the research and development into stratospheric aerosol injections, but only use it as an insurance policy in case we really need it, if we really reach a tipping point? Um, or should we develop it soon in order to, to reach, uh, to avoid that tipping point? Or maybe we do solar radiation management as a part of a uh, do it all approach. So we do mitigation, adaptation, and carbon dioxide removal, and you know stratospheric aerosol injections. So we do it all. So these are different um, scenarios that have been thought about, and they depend on yeah, like funding priorities and the urgency to respond basically to these uh, environmental impacts or tipping points. Um, it's also important to note that the scenarios that we're talking about are, it's not just like, 
a perfect world versus implementing solar radiation management strategies that we are facing climate change um, impacts right now. So it's like, do we, you know, are we comparing this technology to unmitigated climate change or to a strong mitigation effort? So I don't have the answer, but I'm just saying that it's important to think about that. What are we comparing to? I'm going to skip the next slide. So um, the, these step one identify the different risks. Step two um, works on identifying different scenarios that the risk could either accelerate or diminish. And we can see that there they could be influenced by a number of research and funding priorities and other um, environmental conditions, of course. So the the last step that I really will present is that. Um, the, we need to then look at different risk management options. So here are the different risks. This is how they could play out. So what can we do to try and um, diminish some of the risks when possible? So one of the steps within the IRGC's emerging risk guidelines um, is to act on the factors that contribute to the risk emergence. In this case, we think you could do additional research to understand more. You could also work in these communities of practice or code of conduct promote sustainable design and innovation, and uh, establish these multi-stakeholder governance mechanisms. So all of these could act on the factors that could contribute to risk emergence. You can also develop precautionary approaches. So for example, if you were to test and field experiments, maybe you could implement monitoring programs and prohibit large outdoor studies until you have more info from the lab studies. You could also reduce vulnerabilities by establishing um, governance mechanisms, better inform your policy makers and decision makers to how to deal with all of these competing benefits and risks and uncertainties. Um, and also as well as develop more decision support tools. This is a real critical need that policymakers and decision makers need. You also need, you can, if, if you choose to, modify the risk appetite so in our case, we think this is really challenging um, to implement without a global leader right now in this field. And there's even a lack of consensus on what the risk acceptance levels are. You could also use risk governance instruments to manage a familiar risk. And we don't think that this is applicable because stratospheric aerosols are emerging risk. And finally, it is an option to do nothing. So um, we also don't think this is applicable because the risk will be um, dissipated and we have lots of calls for governance of climate management. Okay, so out of the six different IRGC's risk management strategies, we think that really the first three um, here are applicable. So that's what it shows. And then the last steps are just um, to implement your strategy and basically review it when you're done. And again, we don't think these are not applicable because you would really need an organization or regulatory body with oversight to, to implement them. So in conclusion, you know, our analysis, we, we look through the IRGC's Emerging Risk Governance Guidelines as a climate uh, management technology. We can see steps one through three where you identify the risk, you, you think about how they could um, emerge or diminish, and then what steps you could do to actually reduce some of the risk. But we really need an organization, of course, or a regulatory body that's responsible to, to complete steps four and five. And a recent report by the Climate Engineering Assessment um, Forum suggested that maybe there should be even a world commission on stratospheric aerosol injection and solar radiation management technologies that would include a stakeholder dialogue. I mean, this would be very powerful, extremely challenging to pull off, but um, very powerful. And so our analysis, we hope can provide some of the, an overview of the risk governance steps that such a body could take if it were to be um, implemented in the, in the near future. So that's what I wanted to share with you about um, solar radiation management. I will acknowledge my source of funding from, from Duke University. Um, sorry, I kind of live in an international world, so I put every um, language up there. And feel free to reach out to me in, um, by Gmail.
And then here, when I transition to NC State in a couple of weeks, um, I'll be over in the Hump Library. Um, and what I'll be initially working on is continuing my working grip uh, with RTI as well. And then Jennifer and I won a USDA NIFA grant recently to look at the social implications and best practices of responsible innovation in general in the, the food and agriculture. And that will start probably in the summer. I'll still work on my um, risk governance work. And then, bum ba -da bum proposals. So <laughs> if you are interested in collaborating with me on any risk governance, merging technology, gene editing um, proposal, let me know. And I'd, I'd love to hear more about your, your thoughts of working together. So, OK, thank you. So you have a question? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the risk of this technology, when you talk about tipping points and such, and the uncertainty of this technology, can you balance it on the, the risks of our current situation and what those tipping points are? Because there's a lot of uncertainty there. So it seems like there's multiple uncertainties at the foundational level. And I guess my, my point is reading about the collapse of insects and such, how do we know when we've gotten to that tipping point where extraordinary means are important or more important? That's a great question. I don't have the answer. Um, I don't know when, when do you make that decision. Um, I don't know. There's probably climate experts that have looked into that and mm -hmm. probably have substantive answer for you. Um, well, back, let's, uh, I mean, backing it up, the, the uncertainty currently, how, you know, there's uncertainty moving forward and backwards. Is some of that quantifiable, I guess? Is that something that can... I feel uh -huh. that, I'm not a climate change yeah. expert, um, but I feel that our level of uncertainty is so deep and fundamental into because there's there's different types of uncertainty and there's different um, like natures of that uncertainty. So because we are entering a new era, I don't know. I mean, if you look, if we were, um, if we could use historical records to predict the future, that would be one thing. But now we're entering an era where the past does not equal the future. So you have an even greater um, set of uncertainties to add on top of that. So I um, so I feel that it's really it's it's not a mat, it's not a scientific issue on managing the climate now. It's a governance issue. That's true. So, yes. How are you doing? Okay. Oh, good. How are you? I'm fine. Um, a few things. Um, you didn't mention the conspiracy theorists who are very concerned that the trails that are being put up there are there to like read our, our yes. things and do bad things to our minds. That's true. Is it included in our paper? I just it's a who. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the other thing is I've gone to two conferences on geoengineering. Like they, have, they don't know the squat about what the implications of any of this might be. And the um, the Bali Declaration in 2002 <laughs> went on and on and on about how uh, the uh, Pacific Island nations and the world most susceptible to the damages also the parts of the world with none of this technology nor any chance in the future of them deploying this technology. And there is a huge level of resentment with these countries who see their solution is to moderate their development and be kind to the environment. Our solution is to keep it going. Let's see how much we can expose the planet to uh, these gases. And then, oh, by the way, we have this magic way to clean it all up. Uh, and uh, the resentment is just enormous. And I think, I don't think anyone's really nailed that down. I mean, so there was a report out of Bangladesh on geoengineering that was just... Sure. It's like frontierism, right? You're a developing country. 
you need to adopt frontierism. Oh, you're the United States. <laughs> Keep it up. Keep doing everything you want, and then just use this magic, and it will solve everything. Yeah, the so the social, ethical, international implications are enormous. I mean, where do you begin? Like, there's so many, yeah. there's so many issues, and there it's not just new issues. They're all underlying, like decades old, you know, issues. Um, so I totally agree with you. There, there was a paper published, I'm blanking on the author's name, but it was about that um, maybe developing countries need to lead the way in solar radiation management technologies. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, controversies, I, we have a lot. Uh, yeah. So on the political <laughs> side, um, there's a recognizable constituency that advocates for the continued use of fossil fuels, recognized constituency that advocates for nuclear power, dot, 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 um, renewable energy, whatever. Is there a political constituency that's advocating for these technologies? Not to my knowledge. I could imagine that that could take place at some point. But to my knowledge, the advocates that I've been reading in the literature <clears throat> are even concerned scientists who are saying we're not going to hit the 1.5 to 2 degree warming on mitigation alone. So we need to do something else because we're facing catastrophic impacts as it is. So just could we do more research so we know what we're dealing with? Mm -hmm. That's what I do know. Um, but I could look more if there's a political or industrial. It's kind of a follow the money question. So you know, those other constituencies that I give you examples of, they, they all have, there's a money flow, right? Uh, there are economic interests at stake, as well as, in some cases, altruism, right? Um, the people promoting this idea, they may have altruistic intentions, but I don't see any indication of an economic foundation. Sure. This could emerge in the future, but I don't know that it's there yet. Right. One of the impacts or concerns and recommendations has been regarding private funding. Um, that there could be concerns, you know, if private funders were to fund this and their motivations were not entirely altruistic mm -hmm. as well. Um, yeah. Some of the Harvard people are being funded by oil and gas and coal, but oil and gas. Because this becomes an alibi right, right, right. so that we don't right, have right, to right. decrease our carbon emissions. Yeah, right? of course. Yeah. 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 Um, so just to, just to supplement, um, the eco-pragmatists or eco-modernists associated with the Breakthrough Institute are at least willing to talk seriously about this. That's not um, economic driven, but it uh, fits with a pro-technology, pro-environmental plus pro-technology worldview. So okay. there, are, there is an emerging voice. Um, I want to ask a question um, that just kind of also came up. Um, the way that the way that solar radiation management is usually framed in the public sphere is about moral hazard. And we should not yes. even begin to talk about governance because if we talk about governance, it might make it more possible to do it. Yes. And we shouldn't even think about doing it because what we really need to do is mitigation um, right. and or adaptation. Exactly. Now, I mentioned that earlier, like the scene is like a slippery slope. I guess I didn't use the word moral hazard, but do, yeah, do we even like talk about it or, you know, or should we not? And so, I, yeah, I agree that was one of the concerns for even going down this road, you know. But then of the other side of that, um, and I think David Keith and the Harvard group has been advocating for this, that he's like, decision makers will need to make a decision at some point. And so could we give them as much information as possible? Can we do R&D just to provide them with as much information as possible in the event that we would need to have it? I mean, I think 
their argument is that it would be better for the decision makers to have all the information than to be stuck in the situation where they don't know anything about this technology <laughs> and then they may want to deploy it, but under conditions of extreme uncertainty. I don't know. So, yeah, anyway, that was the, the argument. I personally, I don't have, I'm not projecting my view on this. It's just, I'm just sharing some of the um, thoughts from different groups that are out there advocating for or against. Well, by writing the article, you're you're opening, I mean, it's a couple of levels of meta up, right? Sure. We shouldn't even think about this. So we shouldn't think about thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 Yeah, but my, I think the article or the perspective commentary that we have is more about like, can we view this within a larger risk governance framework? And is, are there things that we can do? And so part of step three would, is to better and form decision makers and policy makers and how they can make some of these really hard decisions or are there tools that we could develop for them? Because um, this is what we did um, at FDA on some food safety projects that I was working on and managing like that. The FDA, you know, they were interested in developing like some transparent, robust decision support tools because they were really challenged by handling all the risk benefits, uncertainties, stakeholder views. What do we do, you know, for our unique case? So, I mean, so my point was like, maybe there could be some work, some actual research that develops different decision support tools on this topic that they could, you know, even like an MCDA analysis, like could they, they could, um, develop such a decision support tool that can be modified. Say, if they really wanted to be risk averse, you know, this is your climate management portfolio um, options here. And if you wanted to be less risk averse, could you have another set of, you know, technology options? I guess that's my point, is that you can do something more than just have a discussion where you can actually develop some just different decision support tools for them. So, okay. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Hi, Cameron. Sorry. Um, did you guys see the article yesterday in Quanta about the clouds that are disappearing? Mm -hmm. It'll cost like an extra eight degrees per week. If you get a chance, read it. It's super scary. Um, and it made me think about this about this talk today and if there might be a correlation between um, using this type of technology to mitigate that type of possible outcome. Thanks. So, I'll check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Seen it. It really, it's very scary. <laughs> right. I was just wondering, from a moral hazard perspective, I don't know if the cat's already out of the bag. I mean, there's no way not to discuss this, but I'm, I'm not sure. But I, I do think that Henry brought up this thing about solar panels or something like that. But I think about agriculture. So what percent decrease in solar radiation do they need to hit in order to do that? And we keep talking about increasing yields. Corn doesn't yield if you have a lot of clouds. Right. So I don't have the right have the answer, but I know that this is one of the um, discussion points as well. Is that yeah, but we want to rely on solar energy um, for a number of things, and so this would have a decrease in that. And I don't know. So maybe the then the discussion is about could you deploy these particles in a certain area, like you know, at certain locations that wouldn't have solar panels right. being impacted, you know, maybe it's not just a yes, no question, but right. like how you do it. Yeah, maybe you do it affect, you know, photosynthesis in the ocean. Right. I mean, it seems like a non-starter to me that you can't decrease the amount of solar radiation <laughs> onto the Earth's surface without having ecosystem wide impact. Right, <clears throat> yeah, sure. I understand, so, I don't know. Right. This is where the question of wavelength comes in. What's that? This is where the question of wavelength comes in. If the particles are the size that blocks ultraviolet but not visible, we avoid some of the issues that you're concerned some about. Of the issues. Because yeah. the way the greenhouse effect works is UV comes in and then gets what shunted down to lower wavelengths and trapped, right? But if you can block it when it comes in as UV, potentially. So I this think this, could is, work, right? this is what they were 
what they're trying to work on, you know, like in step one I said that they're, we're in a very early stage of research, so they're identifying the particles, like what are the particles, what are the sizes, like how, how could we do this best? I think that that's where they're still trying to, to figure out. So you, you mentioned Spice and something Pro-X, Scope-X, yeah. yeah. uh, and they were canceled. Can you expand yes. on that a little bit? Yeah, I um, for the Spice experiments. What is Spice? Um, I haven't right, read I've it. It's with stratospheric aerosol right. injections. Um, they, they, I think the UK, and I have more of it in my paper, so, um, but the UK had this whole project with stakeholder engagement about stratospheric aerosol particles, and they were planning on um, deploying it. But they, in this case, there was um, public outcry, and they, and I don't know if this was the one where they also had some conflict of interest with mm -hmm. the d innovators, okay. um, where I think, yeah, the researchers involved, they had also filed a patent. And so then when people got wind that yeah. they were involved in some yeah. patent, then it, you know, okay. people got okay. upset. And so then they canceled that. The Scopex <laughs> that's coming out of the Harvard group it was canceled also, I think, from media pushback or something. Um, and But then recently they want to do it again. Um, and I think they're just using some, like, salt particles. Not, not all of the you know silicon dioxide or whatever. But all those, um, they're trying to do it correctly. Yeah. I wanted to add to Fred's comment. Um, so right now with agriculture, one of the big calculations is does the increased CO two or how does the increased CO two stack up against the cost of things like photorespiration due to warming? If you flip it around and have increased CO2 and less temperature, but less light, then you suddenly have to ask, is, are we able to use all the increased CO2 without enough light right. to run photosynthesis? So you would have to rewrite a big chunk of, big chunks of climate models. Exactly, so there are some climate models that are trying to factor in um, stratospheric aerosols and I know the group at Duke that I'm been working with, they're starting to work on those climate models um, as well. And so I think in the next few years, hopefully we'll get more data that's coming out of these models that have been adapted um, for this. But anyway, there's still, I would expect, large uncertainty or variations. Uh, if I can throw one more in. Um, in terms of like land area, if you assume the oceans are important for photosynthesis, about 40% of the land area has some kind of agriculture on it, grain or crops. So that leaves you 20% of the globe where you might, if you could even contain it that way, you might not expect to have issues. It does seem like a, a major hurdle. Um, even if you can contain it, you don't have that many options or where you could block light without causing them, without <laughs> expecting to cause problems. Mm -hmm. And we have time for one give you very quick comment. comment. This discussion was done, completed in 2009 at the UK Royal Academy that studied this. So if you want to go see that, you'll, 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 this debate will be resolved. The, the other thing to keep up, keep in mind, is that uh, remember that book? You didn't mention the, the, the rich dude who decided to drop all that iron in the ocean. Uh, yeah, iron fertilization. Because that's the big the yeah. big issue is what do you do with those crazy dudes who <laughs> are doing this on their own? Yeah, the rogue actors. Mm -hmm. That's the scary part like of this. Sure. Because you can cause regional droughts pretty easily by doing a whole bunch of stuff up in, up in uh, yeah. the atmosphere. But again, the point is you need a governing body. You need at least you know someone in charge to communicate, to monitor, to, you know, be in charge of this. Right now, it's, like, definitely falling through the cracks. And right. So that's why the governance initiatives have been launching different recommendations. Um, and that recent climate report came out with the suggestion of having a specific body on SRM. Mm -hmm. oh. Thank you. Thank you. People going to lunch.
Ich